Why is the book of Obadiah in the Bible? We have 66 books in the Bible and one of them is Obadiah, this little prophecy. And if you skipped it in your readings every year or it fell out and you read from Amos straight into Jonah, would it matter? You know, does it, does it really add anything to the scriptures? Okay, let's look at that topic for a moment. Now, the reason I'm using Obadiah is to illustrate the question. When you're reading a prophecy, is, this a, is it chronological, this prophecy, to start with? Does it talk about one era and then the next? Is it about the place of Edom or is it about the people? Is it literal or is it symbolic? And that's what we'll explore for a minute. Now, let's start. Why is it in the Bible? Well, I think it's in the Bible for two reasons. It shows what pride is worth. Human pride is one of the three capabilities that you and I have in our brain. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. This book focuses on pride, which is a battle we all have in our natures every day. And it shows how pride will finally be absolutely destroyed. So if we cling on to our pride instead of following the humility of Christ. Our destination is pretty miserable. The other thing this book is about is anti-Semites. Now, anti-Semitism is a growing problem in our world, very strong in Europe and other parts of the world. And anti-Semitism, the hating of Jews, is a real problem. It's also based on pride. Look at Hitler. Why did he hate the Jews so much? Well, I think he had a bit of a complex. He didn't value himself too much, really. Sense of inferiority. And therefore, they, and they pour out all the world's problems on the Jews, as Hitler did. It's all their fault. And they invent these amazing conspiracy theorists about the Jews. Now, anti-Semitism will be absolutely obliterated from the earth when Jesus Christ reigns in Jerusalem and Israel is elevated to the greatest nation of the world and the anti-Semites will all be swept aside. Now, the geographical and topographical features of Edom are an essential background to the book. So if you go there today, you find these incredibly craggy mountains, just amazing uh, ge geological features left behind, which was the territory of Edom. So you understand verse 3 in the background of the book, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, you that dwell in the clefts of the rock. You, you dwell very securely up there in the mountains. Nobody can get you. You're absolutely safe. You can come down on the plains and raid other, other nations and grab their goods. Or verse 4, you exalt yourself as the eagle. You can fly up in the air, away from everybody, and you think you're absolutely fantastic. Well... Even if you set thy nest among the stars, says God, I'll bring thee down. So God say, I don't really care that you right up there in the mountains. It doesn't really matter to me. And the prophet outlines the basic reasons for their pride. And I pinched this from the late brother Peter Schwarzkopf. Five reasons why they're very proud. They are proud because they're very safe and secure. They were proud because of their hid treasures described in verses 5 and 6. The hidden things, the valuable things they had hidden up there in the mountains. Um, verse 7, they were proud because of the, the allies they had, the men of their confederates. They were proud because of their wisdom. And we find that um, particularly in verse 8. I'll destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding from the Mount of Esau. So they thought they were pretty smart. And lastly, in verse five, uh, verse 9, they were proud because of their military power. And we have this term in verse 9, the mighty men, the Gibor, the mighty warriors. They, they thought they were pretty powerful and strong. 
But God says, look, I don't really care about all those reasons you feel proud about yourself. You're finished, right? I'm going to bring you down. And so in verses 10 to 14, he describes their utter destruction. Now, let's get the geography clear. On the right-hand side, you can see the kingdom of Edom. It is below the kingdom of Judah and below the kingdom of Moab. It stretches out below um, Judah and Moab. And some people say, well, it represents, we used to say it represents Jordan because it's part of what was the kingdom of Jordan. And if you go to Petra today, it is in, this area is in Jordan. But, you know, it doesn't work geographically anymore because the ancient territory of Edom is split between the land of Israel and the nation of Jordan. So geographically, it doesn't represent anything anymore. Neither do the people exist. The last Edomites were recorded in the year 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem. There are no Edomites identifiable in the world today. So that makes the prophecy even more intriguing if these people cease to exist. Well, where did they come from? We had these two men, Esau and Jacob. Jacob have I loved and Esau has I hated, says God through the prophet Malachi. And Esau is described as the people against whom Yahweh has indignation forever. But he tells Jacob, I have loved you. So from these two men came two nations. Okay, so Edom's described in Genesis 36 with all these dukes and rulers. And Israel's described in Genesis chapter 35. Jacob was a plain man living in tents. And the ends of these two, Edom has no future. Edom is going to be completely wiped out, but Israel is going to be, have a glorious future. So it was based on the antagonism between these two brothers and it flowed down through their two nations for a long time, for hundreds and hundreds of years. You remember when... Israel tried to go through Edom's country on the way to the Promised Land. They said, no way. Okay, so we want a breakdown of this prophecy. This is pretty good structure. Verses 1 to 14 are against Edom. It's four. Verses 1 to 4, it's going to be humbled. Verses 5 to 9, it's going to be absolutely destroyed. And verses 10 to 14 spell out the reasons for its destruction. Not only hated Israel in the past, but when the Babylonians turn up, the Edomites say, hey, we'll let you in, let you into Jerusalem. We'll help you, Babylonians. We'll help you destroy the city of Jerusalem and take the Jews captive. Well, it didn't work out too well for them either because they also got caught up in this destruction. And then verses 15 to 21 Starts off in verse 15. The day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. So the prophecy broadens out from Edom to all nations. Now, James gets up in the Jerusalem conference and he says, You doubt that the Gentiles are involved in God's purpose? Let me give you some quotes from the Old Testament that prove that the non-Jews will be accepted as part of the hope of Israel before Jesus Christ comes back. And his first quote is from, well, no, actually it's his second quote. He quotes Jeremiah 12, but then he quotes Amos chapter 9. And it's in the words, I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, I'll build again the ruins thereof and will set it up. That's Amos 9.11. And then he quotes in verse 17 that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. Now what Peter does is he takes 
a little bit of liberty in expounding the Old Testament. How does he translate the remnant of Edom? The residue of men. The rest of men. If you like, the remnant of men. So he switches Edom to men. And then he says, and all the Gentiles. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's what Amos said. All the nations. So by... James's day, the Edomites were basically finished. Herod was still there, part Edomite. But he knew the Edomites were coming to their end. They would be extinguished. But the Edomites become representative of all the nations. Now I suggest to you that happens in many Bible prophecies. The Edomites represent all nations, but specifically all nations. Anti-Semitic nations are represented by the Edomites. Okay, so it's no surprise that Obadiah is quoted in Revelation 18 and Revelation 16 of Great Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church who hates Israel. Their hatred of Israel will become more intense. So Jesus Christ uses this language of Obadiah for the destruction of all anti-Semites in the Roman Catholic Church. So I think the first 14 verses of Obadiah are very literal about the proud Edomites. Verses 15 to 21 represent the judgment on all the nations of the world. Now, Brother Peter Schwarzkopf did suggest that verses 19 and 20 have a primary or some sense of fulfilment in the days of the Maccabees. But I'm sure its final fulfilment is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and destroys all haters of Israel. So if you pick up um, Obadiah verse 18... The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph, that's northern and southern Israel, and the house of Esau will be for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken it. So, you know, the symbol of burning the stubble, you've already cut down the wheat crop or the barley crop, and now you're just burning up the stubble. You're finally destroying any vestige, any remnants, any last leftovers of the crop so that they're never known as if they had ever been. And that's the language used in Malachi 4 when Christ comes and he'll burn up the wicked and all they'll be like stubble that's finally got rid of and there'll be nothing left of them all. So when we read so many prophecies about Edom in the Old Testament, I would suggest many of them are about Israel's enemies, the people that hated them. So Ezekiel 35, a whole prophecy of the Israel haters, the Jew haters in the last days. And I think that's primarily Russia and its allies who hate Israel might be one or two of these prophecies where it's not clear whether it's talking about Edom, the territory, or Edom as a symbol of Jew haters. The one that gets the most controversy is Isaiah chapter 63. You'll hear some brethren expound it as if it's a place, Edom, and you have other brethren like Jim Cowie who explain it as a symbol of Edom. I don't think it matters much. It's about Christ vanquishing the nations upon his return. But there is one or two that are not absolutely simple. All right, so places can be symbols, not the literal places. 
I refer you, and somebody asked me about Psalm 83. We don't have time to deal with that tonight. But Psalm 83, of all these nations that will fight against Israel, every one of those nations doesn't exist today. So in thinking about a long-term fulfilment for Psalm 83, we have to look at the nations as symbols. Now, there are symbols which are very intriguing and flow through the scriptures. Uh, one of those somebody raised with me after the last study was the little horn of Daniel chapter 8. Now, let's, let's take a few minutes to look at Daniel chapter 8. So in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9, Daniel sees a little horn. But, you know, the problem is in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, he also saw a little horn. So Daniel sees two little horns and we're sort of thinking, what's, what's these little horns about? Why have we got two little horns and what could these prophecies possibly be about? Well, let's just take Daniel chapter 8. Now, Daniel chapter 8 is about the Medo-Persians and the Greeks. Okay, there's two major symbols in the chapter, a ram and a he-goat, a ram. It's used as a symbol of the Persians. We're told that in verse 20. No debate, no difficulty. Daniel, you saw a ram. It represented the Medo-Persians. And then verse 21, Daniel, you saw a rough goat. That represented the Greeks. So far, so good. Except we always ask the question, what's it, why have we got this prophecy? Because Daniel lived in Babylon. He knew the head of gold was going, but he was intrigued by what was coming next. And what was coming next in verse 20 was the Medo-Persians. Well, if they conquered the great city that he lived in, what would happen to the Medo-Persians? Well, they would be conquered by the Greeks. He was told all of this in advance. Slightly different figures used in Daniel 7, but they don't need to put us off. This is the breast and arms of silver, the Persians, and the bellies and thighs of brass being the Greeks. All right, so he sees this ram, which represents the kings of Medo-Persians, and he does what he will. He's very forceful and very powerful. But in verse 22, he's going to be broken. And the Persian kingdom was very powerful, just as Daniel was told. He saw in verse 4 that it would push northward, westward, northward and southward. Nobody could get deliver themselves from the might of the Persians, or so it seemed. And off they went, pushing across into Iran, pushing north and pushing westward. I didn't last, did it? Because Daniel was told that the Greeks were coming. Now here you go, verse 2. Uh, sorry, verse 5. He saw a he goat come from the west. So he even told the direction to come from. And it touched not the ground. It would be racing across the globe so quickly. And it would smite the ram. And it had a very big horn in the middle of its head. Never seen a goat with one horn, but this is a symbol. And Daniel was told later that, in Daniel chapter 11, a mighty king would stand up who would rule and do according to his will. And we know from history, this is Alexander the Great. He would come from the West. He would be a very notable and powerful first representative of the Greeks. So there'd be a conflict between the ram and the goat and the goat would win. And Alexander spread his empire right across 
the, the world to the east towards the areas of um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And he came right over from Macedonia and Thrace in the west and he went down into Egypt and so he took this massive area. Still, we know that he claimed he cried because there was nothing else to conquer. This was all prophesied by Daniel. But his death was also prophesied. When the goat was strong, when he waxed very great, in verse 8, the great horn was broken. How old was Alexander when he died? 33? Seems pretty young, doesn't it? Any 33-year-olds owning up their 33? No. We're all 43. 63, whatever. Just a very young man, 33, right? And his work was over. He was broken, just as Daniel described. And he was, Daniel was told that when this man died, his empire would be broken up, in verse 8, into four notable parts. And that didn't happen immediately. There was lots of wars and fighting amongst Alexander's generals because there wasn't a successor, a clear successor, and it divided into four bits. A southern bit around Egypt, a northwest bit, around Macedonia, where Alexander had come from, and Greece, a northeast bit around Babylon, and a western part of Macedonia. So he spread his kingdom, or split into four parts. So what do we know of this kingdom? Verse 9, it would grow out of one of these horns out of one power would come a singular power, this little horn, which would wax exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. No guesses for what the pleasant land is. Pleasant land must be Israel. And toward the south, down towards Egypt, and toward the east across to Babylon, Babylon and what we call Iran, Persia, and toward the pleasant land. This little horn would wax great to the host of heaven. So it would oppose God's people, called here in verse 10, the host of heaven. How do we know that's the Jews? Because in the next verse, Christ is called the prince of the host. So God's people who were in the rulership of Israel, would be cast down. This system that was coming would oppose Jesus Christ and they'd take away the sacrificial system. Verse 12, verse 11, the daily sacrifice was taken away. And God was using this little horn in verse 12 Power was given to him against the daily sacrifice and to cast down the truth to the ground and it practised and prospered. Why? Middle of verse 12, by reason of transgression. So the Jews weren't too good, were they? Because of their transgression, this power would be let into their land to punish them. Similarly, in verse 24, his power shall be mighty, he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. They will deserve the punishment that comes upon him. This power that comes to them in verse 23 is described as a king of fierce countenance. This is where we need to put prophecy together because we link that with Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 50. We find Moses talking about this power that would come, who would also speak a very funny language called Latin. I know it's very funny because I suffered two years of it in high school. So I agree entirely with Moses and Daniel. And what does this power do? Verse 25, it causes Christ to prosper. It magnifies itself 
and by peace it destroys many. All right. Who is this little horn? We go back to Elpis Israel. And Brother Thomas says this. We see then that Daniel treats of two little horns. One in chapter 7 and one in chapter 8. But why two little horns? Well, the answer is the one in Daniel chapter 7 is a little horn in the west and the one in chapter 8 is a little horn of the east. Now, why have we become geographical? Because that's the way the Roman Empire was split up. And in fact, came across in two parts. The Romans moved into Egypt, the southern kingdom, and they came into um, Asia Minor from the area on their eastern flank. Philip of Macedon bequeathed his empire and they took it over. He overtook the powers around Ephesus. And they took the rulership. So it was in two parts, an eastern part and a western part. Now, Brother Thomas says, the one in the west is called the Holy Roman Power. It is based around Rome and all the nations that are caught up with Rome. This relates to the ten toes of the image. On Daniel 7, it's ten horns. This is a European Western power of Catholic Europe. But what about the East? The pagan Roman power of the East appeared in Syria and Palestine. We would say Israel today, wouldn't we? Syria and Palestine in the latter end of the Macedonian times and before the ten horns by many centuries. The little horns are representative of powers on certain territories. The little horns do not represent races. So that's a good understanding of the prophecy. It's not about two races. It's about two powers. Two powers that would ultimately be working and collaborating together. He goes on to write, It matters not whether they be pagan Romans, Catholic Greeks, Muslim Turks, or Greek Orthodox Russians. The power that rules in Constantinople, they would call Istanbul, is this little horn of the goat of Daniel 8. So, originally, Constantinople was pagan Roman. Then it was occupied by Catholic Greeks. In 1453, it became the province of Muslim Turks, which it is today. Erdogan is a Muslim Turk. And eventually, it will be occupied by Greek Catholic Romans. Greek Catholic Russians. The Russians will take it. They want the Church of St. Sophia to be back as a church, not a mosque. Putin wants Istanbul. Right? He's going to get it because he will become the little horn of the goat. He began his career, this little horn, by crucifying Jesus. We're told that in Daniel chapter 8, verse 11, he would magnify himself by the prince of the host. The Romans would kill Jesus. He would destroy Jerusalem and its temple, prophesied in Daniel 9. All the power of the dragon in relation to Israel and the land of promise is embodied in the little horn of the east. This eastern power will invade Israel, this little horn of the goat. And in the latter times, when it's the Greek Catholic or Greek Ortho the Orthodox Russians, they will fulfill verse 25. They will cause craft to prosper in their hand. I'm not sure this is Putin yet, because Putin's not all that crafty. You can actually see what he's doing. But whoever's there and takes over Istanbul, probably after we've gone to be with Christ, will practice crafty ways. So, 
this Roman power came into Israel and it was used for the crucifixion of Jesus, for the punishment of Judah in the year 70 and for the abolition of the sacrifices as Daniel was told in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. But the crux of this message is for the latter days because we are told in verse 25, through his policy, he will cause craft to prosper. He shall use peace to destroy people. And eventually, verse 25, he will stand up against the prince of princes. Who's this? Undoubtedly, Jesus Christ. And he shall be broken without hand. Where's that a citation from? Broken without hand? Echo? Rings a bell? Daniel 2? My margin has Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. Is that right? Well, it occurs place, both places, isn't it? He saw the little stone became a great mountain and then he was told in verse um, 44 that this little stone shall break in pieces all other kingdoms. Verse 45, you saw the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, it break in pieces. Right? This power without hands is not, not, not human in that sense. It's Jesus Christ, the great power who will come and smash the nations. Okay, so what do we get out of that prophecy? This is a prophecy from Daniel's day about the Persians and the Greeks. But the main focus of the prophecy is a little horn that would spring up. And the simple understanding of I was taught as a teenager, which works for me, is that Daniel 7 is about the West, Western Kingdom, and Daniel 8 is about the Eastern Kingdom. And Russia will come down through the East, through Constantinople, down through Turkey, into the land of Israel. It's the great power of the East portrayed in Daniel 8. Daniel 7 is the great power of the West, which is the Catholic European force. Okay, so when you're reading prophecy, it's sometimes a little tricky. We come across two horns, two little horns, one in chapter 7, one in chapter 8. What could the difference be? Well, the difference is in their origins, how they developed. The one in chapter 7 developed out of the ten European powers. The one in chapter 8 came down into Israel and it was instrumental in Israel, the Roman forces in Israel. Okay, let's spend just a moment or two talking about time in prophecies. This is quite tricky and I don't want to get into a big argument, but I think some prophecies are clearly chronological. So I'm going to suggest to you I understand the Olivet prophecies in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 as chronological. Right? So you go to Luke 21. I think this is the simplest way to understand Jesus' words. He starts talking about the signs and verses 8 to 20 are what happened in his day in the 40 years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Verse 21 is the events of the year 70. And then he goes on to talk about the times of our day, the times of the Gentiles. And that goes from verse 25 to 36. Now, I know some people disagree with me because in verse 11, I think these great earthquakes and famines and pestilence and fearful signs and great signs 
happened 2,000 years ago, nearly, back in those days. And why do I think that? Because I don't think, young people, brothers and sisters, that verse 12 is going to happen to you or me. I don't think we're going to be delivered up in the synagogues and I don't think we're going to give the Holy Spirit to answer our enemies, as verse 14 and 15 says. All right? Now, if people disagree with me, they'll say earthquakes are a great sign of the times. I remember a brother, you might have forgotten, Brother Alan Dangerfield, and he was very certain that the earthquakes in verse 11 were a sign of our day. Similarly, I've heard people say the pestilence, COVID-19, is a fulfilment of verse 11. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> but I'll let everyone be persuaded in their own mind. I do think ends of all ages look pretty similar. So some of the things that are in verse 11 may apply to our generation. Similarly, I think Matthew 24 is clearly chronological and Jesus marks it out with time markers. And I think Mark 13 is chronological. Now, the one that probably creates the biggest debate, which I'm going to deal with in the last 10 minutes, is the book of Revelation. I'm going to expound the whole book in 10 minutes. No, not um, the book of Revelation works best as a continual flow. And we do know that it starts off in Revelation 6 with six vials and the seventh, uh, six seals. And when they unwrap the six seals, the seventh seal leads into six trumpets. Now, you can't actually prove that the seventh trumpet leads into the seven vials, but chronologically it seems to work. We do know that the last of the vials, the seventh bowl of judgment, does lead into seven thunders. Now, we call this the continuous historic view. Continuous historic. It's continuous, it's a flow of prophecy and it's historic because it starts in John's day and goes right through to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ being established. So it's called continuous historic. There are other interpretations. Brother Thomas said he wrote, read 25 interpretations of the book of Revelation before he wrote his down. So most of those interpretations are written by people who believe in heaven going. So they're not terribly much use and they're full of confusion. So he hoped to write one that made sense. If you're interested in this, you can get Graham Pierce's book, The Revelation, Which Interpretation? And obviously Brother Pierce has been dead a long time, but this book is still very useful. So the continuous historic view, which has been the Christophian view for many years now, is that there are 2,000 years unfolding of history from the year 96 when John received the book of Revelation. And the letters show that the brothers and sisters were in decline. It's a book written to brothers and sisters, not to Israel. And we understand that error had started quite early. You know, even before the apostles were dead, error apostasy had come. And this system of error, Christian error, finally makes war on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I won't, I won't uh, get you into too much information, but the other two dominant views, and there's many views, and most of these views come from the Catholics who don't like the idea that the book of Revelation is about them. So they have one called the Preterist View and, and you know, brothers have taken this up and argued for these Catholic views but I don't find them very powerful. And the Preter, what's called the Preterist View says that half of the book of Revelation happened to Israel before the year 70 and the rest of it uh, happens when Christ returns. Now, in that view, the book has to be written very early before Jerusalem falls in the year 70. 
and they say the sixth seal is the destruction of the Jews. Okay, doesn't have any particular strong biblical argument. To, it doesn't link it to historical epochs and it doesn't clearly follow the, the template of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And it says that the beasts in the book of Revelation are nothing to do with Rome but to Russia or the Arabs. Now the other view is it's futurist, that none of the book of Revelation's happened yet. It's a book for our time. And chapters 6 to 20 are all going to happen in the future. Chapters 4 and 5 are when Christ arrives in heaven. Seals 1 to 4, general description of what's happened in the last 2,000 years. And it then goes on with the trumpets and so on to talk about the things that will happen in the future. And basically the book is all about the future and how us as believers are going to rise up and fight for Christ and we'll be witnessing and then we'll be killed and then we'll be resurrected and so on. So I don't think this is a very helpful view. It also sees that the major problem is Israel. And indeed, it's a bit of a problem, I think, this view, because you start to hate Israel instead of loving them. And vials are more judgments. And the harlot, in Revelation 17, rides the beast, is Israel emerging from the wilderness. Or it could be false Christianity. Or it could be Israel and false Christianity working together. So the problems in this approach, you know, I think we're getting away from the real enemy, which is the Roman Catholic Church and its false teaching. The beasts of Revelation are built on Daniel's image, the idea of this Roman influence in the legs and toes. Okay, and with that, of course, you've got to be careful about symbols. And I've run out of time, so I'll cut my presentation short and just talk about one symbol. In Revelation chapter 13... And verse 18, Revelation 13, verse 18. We have this statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is wisdom, says Christ to John. Let him who has understanding count the number of the beast, the enemy of Christ's followers. It is the number of a man, and his number is 666. As soon as you go and say 666, people have seen so many horror movies, they'll all tell you 666 is the number of the devil. Well, Christ says if you've got wisdom, you'll know what this number is all about. And... Counting um, letters as valued numbers, we wonder what 666 could be. And we have this interpretation in our Christian writings that's the name Latinos. Latinos adds to 666 if you use the values of the Greek letters. And so, how'd you get that? Latinos, obviously, Latin, something to do with uh, Rome. Who pulled that rabbit out of the hat? Well, I can tell you, the rabbit was pulled out of the hat an awful long time ago. Soon after John was dead, people knew that this name Latinos was a name understood in Revelation. So Irenaeus, and I think he wrote earlier than 185, but I can't prove this, less than 100 years after John, he said... Latinos is the number 666. Well, was Irenaeus a freak? No. There was another chap called Hippolytus. He's writing in the year 200, just 100 years after John was dead. And he said, if we take the name as the name of a single man, it is Latinus 
We're talking about the power of the Latins, the power of the Romans. It is about a Roman false system. Yeah? And Christ says, if you have understanding, you'll know what this number and name is all about. Well, it's been known for an awful long time, 1,850 years. Yeah? There's still people inventing new versions of it, but it all seems to point back to this one religious system which corrupts us. Okay, that might have been a bit frag- fragmented tonight, but in summary, when you start to get into prophecy, there is a great blessing. Understanding Obadiah has a blessing. You learn that pride is terrible. You learn that hating Israel is shocking and God will have nothing to do with these people. Daniel chapter 8, you learn that Christ is coming to destroy this little horn, this power that emerged from Alexander. And yes, this little, little horns had lots of power. This little horn crucified Jesus, destroyed Jerusalem. This little horn just got rid of the sacrifices, but one day Christ will get rid of it. It's not that hard. Well, yes, it is hard, but the clues are there, aren't they? We can find the clues if we look. There will always be some differences in prophetical interpretation. So some brethren think Isaiah 63 is Christ coming from the territory of Edom. Some brethren think it's Christ coming from destroying spiritual Edom. Okay, well, let's, let's let them have their differences. Some people think Luke 21 verse 11 refers to today, and I don't, but there we are. These things do not shake our faith. The last comment I'll make about all Bible prophecy is don't try to be a prophet yourself. You know when COVID broke out, one brother said, the stock exchange is about to collapse. All Christadelphians should rush in and buy gold. Well, if you bought gold in March last year, you'd be a bit miserable now. And the stock market didn't collapse. So you've got to be careful about the way we read the prophetic word and make two tight applications to our own day. That doesn't discourage us from looking at science at times, but just be a bit humble about we, the way we apply the prophetic word. Okay, I hope those couple of nights have helped you think about some of the issues of understanding Bible prophecy.